So I want to welcome everyone uh, to another War Industry Resistors Network webinar. Uh, we are a new coalition of groups, uh, local and regional groups, who are standing together uh, to fight against the military industrial complex uh, in our own backyard. My name is Brian Garvey. I'm with the Raytheon Anti-War Campaign, uh, as well as Massachusetts Peace Action. And up here in Massachusetts, uh, we are resisting Raytheon Technologies, one of the largest weapons manufacturers in the world, located right here uh, in Waltham, Massachusetts, about five miles uh, from where I'm sitting. Uh, so we use their presence to localize these issues. Foreign policy issues can seem you know, far away and, and sort of esoteric, uh, but the military industrial complex, the, the folks that are driving these never ending wars and conflicts, they're in our back backyards. They're in, in all 50 states uh, of, of America. And we can use that fact uh, to raise awareness uh, and, and bring attention um, to the fact that the military industrial complex is not just some nefarious group uh, uh, out there in Washington, although they are that. Um, there, there are many of the people are, are right in our own backyards um, and we need to take ownership of that and responsibility for it uh, and resist accordingly. And hence the War Industry Resisters Network. Um, it's a very exciting new network of groups uh, just like the Raytheon Anti-War Campaign uh, who are focused on, on local companies. Um, so tonight we're gonna talk about the military industrial complex and our culture. You know, how these companies that have, are making a fortune off of war uh, have weaseled their way into movies, charities, uh, universities, uh, the media. Uh, and I just want to, to share with you, um, and you'll allow me just one second to, to share my screen, an example of, of what we're up against. Um, and this is, you know what, I seem to have lost, oh, oh, wait, here it is. Uh, here's an example of what we're up against. Uh, and this is a video on the partnership between Raytheon Technologies and the girls. This is a video. Really love to solve problems. Being creative. Think differently. On the partnership between what, what Raytheon Technology. What does it mean to be a Girl Scout? Like a journey. And the Getting me ready this for my future. Video. I really, really love to solve problems. Being... Just give me one more second. Share sound. Like a journey. Getting me ready for my future. I can do anything. Really love Maybe I'll be a robot I will wait for you. I don't want you to have to watch me struggle with technology, right? Um, so let's instead go to our first speaker um, who is going to talk about the military industrial complex uh, and their influence uh, on, on cinema, among other things. Uh, his name is David Swanson. Uh, you, you may know him, but he's an author, activist, journalist, and a radio host. He's also the executive director of World Beyond War, and he's a campaign coordinator for rootsaction.org. Uh, uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to David. Thank you uh, very much for having me. Um, and, and what little I know, you might try this in a minute. Uh, if you, when you share screen, if you click uh, com use computer sound and then you mute your own audio so you don't get the echo, uh, sometimes it works. Um, but uh, so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about movies. Uh, I'm not going to show you one and I didn't make a slideshow, but uh, hopefully it will be worthwhile. Propaganda is most impactful when people don't think it's propaganda. For example, a spirited debate in the media over whether one needs more troops and weapons to counter Russia's aggression or more diplomacy and negotiation to counter Russia's aggression is propaganda made, meant to make it unthinkable that the main problem at hand is anything other than Russian aggression. It's also, meant to make you think you're watching a free and open debate rather than propaganda. Another form of propaganda that nobody spots 
is omission. When your television never tells you that there was a coup in Ukraine in 2014, your understanding of the history of Ukraine proceeds merrily along without it. This also happens in Hollywood. When a movie isn't made because the US military won't provide bases, troops, ships, or weapons, there's usually no news about the absence of that movie. There's certainly nothing about that absence to match what would have been present had it been made. Propaganda that some people can spot as propaganda is still very effective on many other people. And in the case of Hollywood movies, even on people who recognize it for what it is. That's the power of showing rather than telling, of making people experience something. There has there never has been and never could be a drone murder scenario resembling the one in the film Eye in the Sky. But nobody has watched any real one, apart from members of the military who sometimes uh, have suicidal tendencies afterwards. Nobody has watched a real one. Uh, and, and lots and lots of people have watched a nonsensical one. Same with all the ticking time bomb torture movies, same with all the Venezuela is out to get you or the Nazis could have taken over North America movies. What does it matter if they're ridiculous? What does it matter even if you understand that they are ridiculous? You've seen them for yourself. You have felt the fear. You've identified with the glory. The reason that it can take hours to get someone to understand the basic facts about World War II is that they've seen many hundreds of hours of the innocent US government being attacked out of the blue and doing its utmost to save victims of Nazism and winning the war without any significant allies and spreading democracy far and wide. One reason that you don't see a lot of movies about the conferences held to reject the Jews or the corporate support for Nazism or the arms race with Japan or the grotesque escalation of the war or the hiring of so many Nazis into the US military or the successes of nonviolent activism against Nazis and thousands of other governments is that the US military disapproves. When we imagine that the US military only occasionally or slightly influences US movies, we are very badly deceived. The impact is on thousands of movies made and thousands of others never made. And television shows of every variety, the military guests and celebrations of the US military on game shows and cooking shows are no more spontaneous and are no more spontaneous or civilian in origin than the ceremonies glorifying members of the US military at professional sports games, ceremonies that they have been paid for and choreographed by UX tax dollars and the US military. The so-called entertainment content carefully shaped by the entertainment offices of the Pentagon and the CIA doesn't just insidiously prepare people to react differently to news about war and peace in the world. To a huge extent, it just substitutes a different reality for people who learn very little actual news about the world at all. The US military knows that few people watch boring and non-credible news programs, much less read boring and non-credible newspapers but that great masses will eagerly watch long movies and TV shows without too much worrying about whether anything makes sense. We know that the Pentagon knows this and what military officials scheme and plot as a result of knowing this because of the work of relentless researchers making use of the Freedom of Information Act. These researchers have obtained many thousands of pages of memos and notes and script rewrites I don't know whether they've put all these documents online. I certainly hope they will at some point uh, and make that available to all of us. I wish such a link were in giant font at the end of a wonderful new movie, which is called Theaters of War, How the Pentagon and CIA Took Hollywood. The director, editor, and narrator is named Roger Stahl. The co-producers, Matthew Alford, Tom Seeker, Sebastian Kempf, and they have provided a very useful public service. 
I, by the way, has simply wrote a review of this movie uh, from which I am, I am now quoting from my review, uh, which got me invited to this wonderful meeting we are part of now. In this movie, we see copies of and we hear quotations from an analysis of much of what has been uncovered and learn that thousands of pages exist that nobody has yet seen because the military has just refused to produce them. Film producers sign contracts with the U.S. military in many cases or the CIA in others. They agree to, quote, weave in key talking points. While unknown quantities of this sort of thing remain unknown, we do know that nearly 3,000 films and many television shows uh, and many thousands of television episodes have been given the Pentagon treatment and many others the CIA treatment. In many film productions, the military essentially becomes a co-producer with veto power in exchange for allowing the use of the bases and the weapons and the experts and the troops. And the alternative is denial of those things. But the military is not as passive as that might suggest. It actively pitches new story ideas to movie and TV producers. It seeks out new ideas and new collaborators who might bring them to a theater or laptop near you. Act of Valor actually began life as a recruitment advertisement. I've never seen Act of Valor, by the way. Some of these movies I listed here, I haven't watched them, thank God. Uh, of course, many movies are made without military assistance. Many of the best never wanted it. Many that wanted it and were denied managed to get made anyway, sometimes at much greater expense without the U.S. tax dollars paying for the props. But a huge number of movies are made with the military. Sometimes the initial movie in a series is made with the military and the remaining episodes voluntarily follow the military's line. Don't try to rewrite the plot. Uh, these practices are sort of normalized. The military sees huge value in this work, including for recruitment purposes. This alliance between the military and Hollywood is the main reason that we have lots of big blockbuster movies on certain topics and few, if any, on others. Studios have written scripts and hired top actors for movies on things like Iran-Contra that have never seen the light of day because the Pentagon rejected them. So nobody watches Iran-Contra movies for fun the way they might watch a Watergate movie for fun, and so very few people have any idea about Iran-Contra. But with the reality of what the U.S. military does being so awful, what, you might wonder, are the good topics that do get lots of movies made about them? Well, a lot of them are actually fantasy or distortion. Black Hawk Down turned reality and a book it was supposedly based on on its head, as did Clear and Present Danger. Some, like Argo, hunt for small stories within larger ones. Scripts explicitly tell audiences that it doesn't matter who started a war for what, that the only thing that matters is the heroism of troops trying to survive or to rescue one soldier. Yet actual military veterans are often shut out and not consulted. They often find movies rejected by the Pentagon as being unrealistic to be very realistic. And those created with Pentagon collaboration to be highly unrealistic. Of course, a huge number of militarily influenced films are made about the U.S. military fighting space aliens and magical creatures, not clearly because it's believable, but because it avoids reality. On the other hand, other military influenced films shape people's views of targeted nations and dehumanize the humans living in certain places. The military has written policies on what it approves and what it disapproves. It disapproves depictions of failures. <laughs> you know, how many movies could we have if it weren't for that? And crimes, which eliminates much of reality. It rejects films about veteran suicide, about racism in the military, about sexual harassment in the military, about assault in the military. But it pretends to refuse to collaborate on films because they're, quote, not realistic. Yet if you watch enough of what is produced with military involvement, you will imagine that using and surviving nuclear war is perfectly plausible. 
This goes back to the original Pentagon Hollywood invention of myths about Hiroshima and Nagasaki that runs right up through military influence on the day after, not to mention the transformation paid for by people who throw a fit if their tax dollars help prevent someone from freezing on the street of Godzilla from a nuclear warning to the opposite. In the original script for the first Iron Man movie, the hero went up against evil weapons dealers. The US military rewrote it so that the hero was a weapons dealer who explicitly argues for more military funding and sequels stuck with the theme. US military, the US military advertised its weapons of choice in Hulk, in Superman, in Fast and Furious, in Transformers. The US public effectively paying to push itself to support paying thousands of times more for weapons it would otherwise have no interest in and not knowing it's doing this. Documentaries on the discovery and history and National Geographic channels are military made commercials for weapons. Inside combat rescue on National Geographic is recruitment propaganda. Captain Marvel exists to sell the Air Force to women. Actress Jennifer Garner has made recruitment ads to accompany movies she's made that are themselves better recruitment ads. A movie called The Recruit was largely written by the head of the CIA's entertainment office. Shows like NCIS push out the military's line, but so do shows you wouldn't expect. Reality TV shows, game shows, talk shows with endless reunifications of family members, cooking shows, competition shows, etc. Theaters of War, wonderful movie, ends with a recommendation that movies be required to disclose at the start any military or CIA collaboration. Also notes that the U.S. has laws against propagandizing the U.S. public, although there are some loopholes created in those, uh, which might make such a disclosure a confession of a crime. And I would just add that since 1976, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights has required that, quote, any propaganda for war shall be prohibited by law. Imagine if that were abided by. Thanks for having me. Thank you, David. Um, yeah, uh, imagine if it were. Um, thanks for providing that explanation on why so many, so many films, so many blockbuster films uh, uh, portray the U.S. military as as heroes, uh, and and the U.S. military as something that should be funded uh, over and over and over again to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I just want to pitch one thing before we get to our next speaker. Uh, I already shared with you the website, uh, but on that website, you're gonna find a form. Um, if you're not already joined up with this campaign, this network, um, the War Industry Resistors Network, I encourage you to click that link in the chat. I'll also be sending it to you in a follow-up email. Um, that'll, that'll ask you, you know, whether you're in an organization, whether you're interested in joining one, uh, which military uh, corporation uh, or target that's associated with the military industrial complex is in your backyard. Uh, we wanna know. We formed this network uh, because we found that there were groups all across the country uh, that were focused uh, on these military companies specifically. Uh, and we built this network so that we can lean on each other and amplify each other's messages. Um, so I, I encourage you, check out the website uh, and fill out that form and join us and make us stronger. Um, but next, uh, I am going to bring to the screen uh, Chris Velasquez, who is going to talk about the military industrial complex uh, and video games. Um, uh, Chris is the digital organizer for Vets for Peace. Uh, they're the lead organizer for Gamers for Peace. Uh, Chris was a civil affairs operator in the U.S. Marine Corps from 2004 to 2010 with combat deployments to Fallujah, and Fallujah in Iraq and Helmand province in Afghanistan. Uh, Chris is a lifelong gamer who is committed to using digital gaming and hobby spaces to engage anti-war and social justice activism 
while combating the predatory recruiting practices uh, of the military. Chris, floor is yours. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, uh, I hope everybody can hear me right now. Audio is good. Excellent. So uh, thank you so much for that introduction, Brian and David. That was amazing listening to you. I'm uh, very, very, in a very similar vein, uh, David led off with uh, one form of, of media, uh, and I'm going to piggyback onto uh, a growing media that has more and more military influence and recruitment practices and even heavier uh, implications because of the interactive nature of it, instead of just seeing, witnessing, and immersing yourself in, in a visual storytelling apparatus, I'm going to uh, get into gaming, where there's actual physical components and, and training components, neurological development components. Um, but before I dive into that, I actually uh, wanted to bring something up for Brian and uh, lead us off with that, uh, that video that Brian had set up. And so that tweet is uh, the Girl Scouts, programming like the pros, cracking all the codes. The new think like a programmer journey prepares Girl Scouts to make the world a safer and better place. Thanks at Raytheon. And here we go. What does it mean to be a Girl Scout? It's like a journey. Getting me ready for my future. I really love to solve problems. Being creative. Think differently. Girl Scouts have always solved problems. I break problems into little pieces. Try different solutions. Think like a programmer. I can do anything. Maybe I'll be a robotics engineer. Work in cybersecurity. A rocket scientist. Being a Girl Scout makes me believe in me. And I'm going to change the world. Awesome. What is um, so that is from, that is a tweet from 2018, August 30th, 2018. And I can't believe I've never seen that before. Brian just taught me something new and actually kind of is completely comp upended everything I was going to talk about. Uh, so I'm going to jump ahead and I want to throw something up on the screen for comparison real quick that I wasn't prepared to talk about until later. So we're going to do this a little out of order, but, uh, I want to see if anybody notices some similarities with uh, a current uh, a current ongoing U.S. Army ad campaign called titled the What's Your Warrior campaign. And this is a, a one minute long video uh, from November 11, 2019. Let's uh, see if you, anybody notices some things. There's a separate video that I meant. I'll bring that back up in just a moment to show the correlation. But essentially, the ad campaign is talking about the classes that you can be. And it starts talking about code breakers, cybersecurity, and emphasizes a diverse cast of the P individuals filling that and, and focusing on women and diverse representations uh, in those roles. And I just found that link uh, between that Raytheon commercial uh, and the focus on future warfare, really, really prominent. And I'll get into more details about that as, as we go through. But uh, gaming technology, gaming technology, how does that all tie into gaming technology and militarism and recruitment practices of the military and the propaganda that David Swanson was talking about that we let off with? Gaming is a fast-growing uh, industry. 
uh, is set to overtake movies uh, and by sheer scale and audience reach around the world with platforms such as Twitch outpacing growth over the course of the pandemic, uh, outpacing Netflix in new viewership and amount of uh, media consumed. Uh, Twitch and gaming is a gaming adjacent space, right? Uh, so I will start off with our friend at Second Thought, uh, who has come on to the Gamers for Peace Twitch channel and sh streamed content with us, did an excellent breakdown of some basic information regarding some of the stuff that's ongoing within uh, the military's use of gaming and why they're shifting to that. And I just want to highlight a couple minutes of that video uh, that they have uh, on the military has been adamant practices. about maintaining a fighting force of 500,000 soldiers, and this requires an intense recruiting program. So, how does the world's largest military entice the next generation of soldiers? Well, these days, it seems to be with cartoons that appropriate inclusive language, video games, and taking advantage of those in poverty. Let's start with the video games. I'm sure you're all familiar with Twitch. If somehow you're not, Twitch is the largest live streaming platform in operation right now. They bring in insane numbers of both streamers and viewers, averaging roughly 3 million concurrent viewers at any given time, who watch a total of around half a billion hours of content per week. That's a huge audience, and a lot of time spent on individual streams, which can run for hours. As far as demographics go, the audience skews young and male, with about 65% of viewers being male, 41% between the ages of 16 and 24, and 73% between the ages of 16 and 34. To military recruiters, Twitch is a dream come true. You have a captive audience of young, impressionable viewers who tend to develop parasocial relationships with the streamers they watch. It's the perfect medium for young, charismatic recruiters to pitch the military to the next generation. And they know this. In 2018, the U.S. Army launched its own Twitch channel as part of its new, more modern approach to recruitment. The Navy followed suit shortly after. In the first six months of 2020, the military had bagged 13,000 new recruiting leads from Twitch alone. Keep in mind that many Twitch users are underage, as you only have to be 13 years old to make an account. So, you have young, incredibly malleable children watching trained Army and Navy recruiters play games like COD and Fortnite for hours on end, while they surreptitiously try to convince their viewers to join the military. If this sounds incredibly shady and predatory, that's because it is, and it gets worse. Early in their streaming endeavors, the Army esports mods would ban users for asking about U.S. war crimes, until they were eventually forced to unblock those people after accusations of First Amendment violations. Then there's the Navy claiming that their streamers aren't recruiters, despite the fact that they're required to take the same training courses as Navy recruiters before they're considered for the role. The Army even went so far as to just straight up lie and put up a link to a fraudulent Xbox giveaway, which, when clicked, instead took you to an Army recruitment information form. This was later taken down by Twitch. Hassan Piker, one of the most popular left- Stop that one there. No, that was our friend uh, at Second Thought Content Creator on YouTube. Uh, it's amazing coverage about the some of the recruiting practices of the United States military and gaming adjacent spaces and recent ad campaigns. Um, so the numbers there show what Twitch, a platform that uh, reaches uh, millions of viewers uh, per minute, is uh, currently being utilized by the military and gaming. So you may the history of the military's participation in gaming. In gaming, military's been in gaming spaces, uh, video games spaces, uh, pretty much since the inception of video games. You can point at Doom, nineteen ninety, uh, the classic first-person shooter. Uh, Doom uh, at one point had a mod called the Marine Mod that was developed by the Marine Corps as a training tool to train Marines in 1990. It was that mod was original, uh, eventually released commercially and allowed for people outside the military to play and use an actual training tool the Marine Corps was using at the time. Over the years, that has evolved into games like First to Fight and eventually America's Proving Ground, which was uh, America's Army Proving Grounds, which is developed in uh, August 2013. Uh, so we're coming up on our 20 year lifespan of, of uh, the entire uh, franchise of America's Army Proving Ground being the third development of it. Um, America's Army's Proving Ground, it, this is an unabated or just bold face uh, recruitment tool. It was advertised as recruitment and received a lot of backlash as uh, links to recruiters were placed inside there. Training modules were put in there. The emphasis on how to go through. In fact, better than just me explaining that to you, here's a video from... Twitch. 
2013, made by a content creator. This video has over 57,000 views since 2013. This is, once again, highlighting the kind of content that uh, people are absorbing. I'm a minute and a half into this video, and it is running uh, at uh, 1.75 speed, so it will sound a little fast for people. Um, I'm just doing that for time constraints, and I'll highlight the important parts that are said out of this. And nobody likes to be dead. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the game, uh, as well as my history. If it was not for the original America's Army, I would have never played Call of Duty or Battlefield or any of the other modern shooters. It was the first game that I ever took, I guess, into a competitive nature. I did play it competitively. I, uh, I played a lot of it. I played a whole lot of it. And just from jumping in this game, it's bringing me back. Now, the last two titles for America's Army were not that good. Um, so I was kind of hesitant about this one. I was expecting to be disappointed. No, nah, not having it. This game is incredible. It is a free-to-play available on Steam. Put it in your library because it deserves to be there. I would, I would generally say that this game uh, is simple. Now, for most games, I would say this is simple, but that's what they're aiming for. That's what they're going for. There are four weapons total with about two scopes you can use. This game is not about flash. It's not about sex appeal or how many things you can add to it to make it look cool and better than the last year's. It's not about that. It's about staying true to what the game is meant to be, and that's supposed to be tactical, skillful, and you're needing a bit of synergy. You need communication and teamwork. You can see exactly right here. Call of Duty and Battlefield, I don't run around every corner than naturally ADS. I don't just aim down sight. You do that in this game. You got to pay attention to where things are. You got to communicate. And that is something that is built into the game as well. And it's not your standard run into an Xbox Live lobby with 12 kids quick scoping, just dicking around. You don't have that. You get into a game, you're going to hear people playing tactically. I'm smoking this. Cover me. I need to go revive this guy. Can you cover suppress fire? You see that stuff. These guys actually play like that. So the community itself is great. It is very similar to how the old Battlefield community used to be kind of elitist, kind of not wanting kids to mess around. But at the end of the day, it's a solid game. They will come. And it's something that you're going to have to deal with and acknowledge. The game itself handles great. Visually, it's impressive. It's built on the Unreal Engine. It looks pretty damn good for a. I will let you know it does not look pretty good, even for games at 2013. He goes on to talk about the uh, the advertisements and recruitment uh, posters that are seen throughout the game. Uh, but the key emphasis here is the emphasis on that this is such a great game. It's a free-to-play game that it was available widely, and it's actually very popular. Uh, great news about this, though. Uh, the Army declared that it is shutting down uh, it is being pulled its servers and online functionality is going to be removed. Uh, and it's being shut down on May 5th. So that's a win for us. And when we're talking about gaming technology and melters, I mean, the, the usage of uh, recruiting tools like this game. Um, though that isn't a complete win. Uh, the much like the influence that, uh, that David was talking about to, at the start over Hollywood that the military has, uh, they have they exert they have found better more success outside of developing games for themselves and instead allowing AAA uh, title producers create content like Call of Duty, uh, Escape from Tarkov, and uh, similar very high dollar very well established game franchises, and they exert influence over that. Uh, they also have found more success in being gaming adjacent spaces, much like Twitch, as I talked about, Discord, YouTube, and in other places where they have content creators playing other games and directly reaching and utilizing parasocial relationships or relationships that are unidirectional, uh, where a content creator is using a form of mass communication. And in the interface of these platforms, uh, a community is built and a relationship is developed utilizing the chat where uh, a relationship, the, the viewer feels as if they have an actual relationship directly with the person on screen. And that's largely because of the interface and the interactive capability of these spaces. Uh, the Army has also found uh, extensive influence and a benefit in staying inside of esports and actually developing their own competitive gaming teams to participate in tournaments, participate at gaming conventions, and be an, a recruitment asset there on the ground. Uh, the, the other reason uh, the Proving Grounds uh, pull-down isn't a complete win is because the game will still be available to download, at least, all, at least on PC, and private servers will and mission editor uh, will still be available as uh, and local play on a computer uh, without being online will still be working. Uh, that means recruiters or uh, communities can develop and host private servers and still invite people to play this game uh, and compete in this game. And it's often that games that are removed from 
being actively supported by its original developers, develop intense modding communities or game, uh, communities of people that write additional code, modify the original game and implement new features and things like that. Um, there's a lot to be said about the modding community and how toxic culture recruitment practices and violent extremism practices uh, all, all tie into uh, creating a toxic culture that uh, that can promote extremist uh, recruitment material uh, on the back of uh, institutionalized recruitment propaganda that is called uh, that is often co-opted. Um, so, with America's Army proving ground being being shelved, quote unquote. Uh, we see one recruitment tool being less per less pervasive, but we see that the the military has other plans. And this video is going to show a little bit about those esport recruitment tools and explain the depth by which they go. I'm here at Fort Knox, named after the country's first ever Secretary of War, who definitely never imagined that his name would grace the home of the U.S. Army esports team. Sergeant First Class Christopher Jones runs the team and agreed to show me around. Okay, there we are. So here you have the main area of the U.S. Army Esports facility. Whatever they need in order to be able to perform their best, they got it. After a career spent in the military police and as an old school recruiter, his current mission is to find the Army's best gamers to stream and compete against other esports teams. This is obvious. I got to get this one out of the way. How good are y'all? We're pretty good. So in this room right here, we actually have our League of Legends team as well as the other two players that are playing Apex Legends as well. Place for everybody to come in, do their work for the day, mm -hmm. and head out from there. Do their work for the day. Yes. Log in, get your reps in, reviewing footage, reviewing who your opponent is. Really not just coming in and playing games, really getting the strategy in. Absolutely. Ready to go. You can't join the Army just to play video games. All the soldiers here have had other positions in the military. The esports team, which is part of the Army's recruiting command, is only a temporary assignment. Your job is coming in and playing games. Yeah. Yes. How is that? It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's no worse it's amazing. It's great. You know, like my dad sit there and he'll tell me like, yeah, I told you playing those games would pay off. At first they, they don't believe it. And then like you, you show them like you playing here, like against this team, they're like, wow, that is actually you. And it just like blows their mind. I'll get a pal this killer. Oh, oh god. We can actually show you the last one, which is our production area. Yeah, sure. So this one, we have our own sound booth for it. If you want to be you know, a streamer and be able to have a nice production, you know, this is what you would expect to see. This is the control center. Look at this. Two separate keyboards, three monitors, one of them is vertical, Xbox controller, two mice, a magic eight ball. <laughs> this, is, this is a nice setup. Y'all not playing around over here. These production values are what we're used to seeing from big pro teams backed by NBA owners. But the Army's goal here isn't winning tournaments or getting cash prizes. It's to convince young people that life in the Army isn't just getting yelled at by a drill sergeant or getting shot at in Afghanistan. We call it kind of like the family within the family. The esports team is there to convince kids that the Army can be a place where you can not just have a career, but maybe even have fun. She dodged my E. Oh. Less than 50% of um, the young adults in America today have any idea what it really means to serve in the Army, um, much less you know what a soldier does or what they look like. Less than 1% of our country serves in the military. So if less than 1% of our country serves in the military, um, you might know about service in the military from a family member or a friend who served, mm -hmm. but that's such a low percentage that actually serve in the military. And so unless you have a close connection between friend or family, um, you, you're not going to have an awareness. You're only going to know what you potentially know about service in the military from Apologize. watching movies or watching TV shows, which is not reality. The purpose of the brigade that I currently am fortunate to be a part of is to connect America's people with America's army. Um, the assets that are part of our brigade get out all four corners of the U.S. to showcase that diversity um, about what lifestyle in the army can be like to dispel myths or misconceptions about what is or is not allowed uh, as you serve in the army. We wanna be where the young adults are today. So if we wanna get our message out, we have to be where they are. I got to check out one of the gaming trucks they bring to schools and gaming conventions. Yo, please explain. So I'm ending here on this, uh, this or I'm displaying this. This is a truck they take to schools and conventions uh, to allow people to play and get information uh, and put people in the recruitment pipeline. Recruitment still pre have, uh, heavily requires or relies on the economic draft, uh, where people, uh, youth, are looking to uh, leave uh, high school and don't have many options. Uh, and the military is positioned in this gaming space to advertise directly to that. Uh, the reason that some of this is really, really important and things that we need to address. This is an Army-wide email for U.S. Army eSports that just went out uh, a month ago. There are currently 209,000 people in this, in this Reddit thread, uh, and it talks about all the ways in which the Army is looking for people to get involved, advertises their Discord channel where anybody can, which is open to the public and people can join. The reason so much of this is important is because we see as we as we as we research more of the recruitment practices and and 
the use of gaming technology, we continue to see a link between the technology's usage and future warfare. Uh, we see how the language, military language that is put into the social culture and reinforced in gaming language in order to communicate to effective at these games, increases the usage of words like military age mail and target, uh, designated target and tactical, tactical um, speech. Uh, I want to quote from Lisa Langan, Sean Westmoreland's The Kill, the Kill Cloud, The Real World Implications of Network Network Centric Warfare, which was published in Whistleblowing for Change, Exposing Systems of Power and Injustice. <clears throat> Further complicating the substantial public discourse is the prolific use of military acronym, acronyms and nebulous descriptors such as DCGS, Distributed Common Ground Systems, EPIE, European Partnership Integration Enterprises, Military Aged Male, or TARGET. These acronyms and descriptors control public access to information and often serve to impede researchers' access to knowledge over time. They are part of a massive infrastructure built to increase the speed at which complex ideas and concepts are communicated with limited human networks while simultaneously obfuscating them to the uninitiated. The use of acronyms also strips away any emotional context that will communicate the effects of what the letters represent in the real world. For example, phrases like military aged male, imminent threat or target have become normal representations of human beings, many of whom never were nor intended to be combatants. They were innocents. Dr. Sarah Shocker, uh, through her research, was able to rigorously work around obstacles to empirically demonstrate that data analysts use stereotypes about gender and religion to inform who is selected as a drone target. In her book, Military Aged Males and Counterinsurgency in Drone Warfare, Shocker argues that the normative use of the category military aged male has contributed to the deterioration of civilian protections. Uh, Lisa Ling and Sean Westmoreland uh, both go on to say that they agree uh, with her. Uh, uh, argument and the conclusions. This is, gets it, it really important because we see technology shifting for future warfare to be drone operators, the kill cloud and the, the language and the predisposition to military culture, uh, the justifications for uses of violence, uh, and the technology utilizing gaming controllers for uh, remote piloted weapon systems attached to that kill cloud. Gaming technology cultivates information uh, and flows into the future where the army within in 2022 uh, it has, has declared that in 2022, it'll be doing uh, a company sized uh, battle simulation of remote piloted man machine interfaced uh, tanks. Uh, so that's about 150 tanks versus 150 tanks in open warfare combat that are being remotely piloted through systems that are very similar to playing Call of Duty or uh, World of Tanks and any and uh, Battlefield. Uh, this three extremely popular uh, household uh, games that are played by children as young as 13, but even in most spaces, we know that children younger than that are playing these games. Uh, we've seen this technology in deployment in the field in two recent assassination attempts where the, the remote sniper uh, machine gun was deployed using an AI-controlled algorithm, that, not an AI like a computer system controlling the entire thing. It's a remote pilot with a joystick designating when to shoot, adjusting for lag, and the addition of an AI system assisting in that video game implementation of a real world weapon, weapon system. This all ties into uh, the, the imagery that is used to, in these games as recruitment tools for the military that creates a culture for violent extremism, both on the uh, uh, both right wing extremists and uh, Islamic or any type of terrorist extremists to, to uh, recruit from. Um, we see videos coming from uh, Hezbollah that ma match in uh, MARSOC tactical videos that show training simulations and the things that uh, MARSOC or the military uses for their training and recruitment videos. And we see that the, the space of technology expands beyond just Raytheon, Boeing, and Lockheed Martin for the developers and the, and the industries that benefit 
in in warfare, but we see a vested interest of the military in being associated with AWS or the uh, Amazon cloud or Google and the partnership that Google is trying to develop once again after it formerly being denied with the military. We see the partnerships with Activision, Blizzard, uh, and in the development of games like Six Days in Fallujah, which has thankfully been delayed. Uh, the platform Six Days was a campaign that the Council on American Islamic Relations, CARE, and Veterans for Peace, uh, the initiative Gamers for Peace of Veterans for Peace participated in, uh, which delayed uh, this game called Six Days in Fallujah, which is supposed to be a military simulation reenactment of a battle that that contained war crimes, a use of white phosphorus and depleted uranium that has lasting repercussions to this day in Fallujah. Uh, in a realistic sense. And this game received massive pushback and has been delayed till 2022, quarter, quarter four. And we're hoping to continue to de-platform that game. But the expansion of gaming technology expands what we need to consider war industry uh, technologies or companies to include our hobby and entertainment spaces as they are integrated more and more into the development and implementation of future warfare, recruitment, and all, all around fostering a war culture by which we can easily manufacture consent and takes us to uh, the place where we currently reside with war at the, uh, uh, behind every corner and lurking in every shadow and uh, a populace that is ready to ju have that justified. Uh, I appreciate you for uh, listening and staying uh, while I talk through that all. And thank you very much. Thank you for that fantastic uh, presentation. That was excellent. And you just provided us with a huge amount of evidence of how the military uh, and these, these companies that, pr that profit uh, uh, from, from massive military spending are, are involving themselves deeply, deeply in our culture and our entertainment and hobby spaces, as, as Chris just said. And getting at kids too, you know, uh, you know, 12, 13 years old. So it's, um, it's something that we all need to resist. And if you're interested in joining the uh, War Industry Resisters Network, or you want to find out more, please visit this Veterans for Peace page uh, on our network. It includes a Google form. If you uh, have a similar group that we don't know about yet, we found out uh, there are some in Australia just uh, uh, less than two weeks ago. And they're going to be joining our, our network to um, uh, to protest some some bad investments that Australia's sovereign wealth fund um, is making. So if you're interested in joining our now international network, uh, visit uh, that site and, and sign up. Uh, we are going to be doing a week of action uh, around tax day uh, in, in late April. And there are going to be coordinated actions all across the country and well, now even internationally uh, against these companies. And like Chris said, you know, it's not just the ones that you know, Raytheon, Boeing, Lockheed. Uh, it's, it's banks that are making money off of this. It's, um, uh, it's, it's these entertainment companies uh, as well. Um, it's it's uh, congressional members of Congress who are, are taking this, this cash. Uh, but I want to bring on our last speaker who wants to talk about another element of how the military industrial complex uh, is involving itself in our culture, uh, and that's universities. Um, so I'm going to bring to this to the stage uh, uh, Marcy Winograd of Code Pink right now. Hold on. Let me just bring you up. And uh, Marcy, for people who don't know her, is a coordinator of Code Pink Congress longtime anti-war activist. Uh, uh, she was on Daniel Ellsberg's uh, defense team, uh, obviously the whistleblower uh, who brought us the Pentagon Papers. Uh, she's a retired English and government teacher. Uh, she blogs about militarism and foreign policy at laprogressive.com. And she's recently written a piece on the effects of these military companies that we've been talking about. Uh, on the culture of the University of California at Santa Barbara. Uh, 
Um, so Marcy, will you tell us a little bit uh, about the piece that you just wrote? Yeah. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you, Massachusetts Peace Action. Chris Velasquez, Veterans for Peace. I work with Veterans for Peace's Climate and Militarism Project. It's a great honor to be with uh, those activists. And thank you, David Swanson, World Beyond War, Roots Action, all of you involved in this program. I was thinking when Chris was talking about my own grandson, he is four and a half. And when I went to visit him this morning, as I take care of him in the morning, uh, <clears throat> he was on his iPad and he said, look, Momo, he calls me Momo. Look, Momo, um, I'm going to attack this battleship. And I was stunned. And I said, well, uh, do you have something besides a war game to play? And he said, this is not a war game. This is a battleship. So uh, it's so pernicious and omnipresent, this militarism in our culture and so that's something for me to talk to his mom about. Uh, but it begins uh, before kindergarten, right? I used to be a, a literacy coach and we would talk about how college begins in kindergarten. Actually, um, militarism begins before that. So it's something to be aware of and vigilant about. <clears throat> my, my focus has been as a, uh, a whistleblower of sorts. I live in Santa Barbara. And uh, this is home to the University of California at Santa Barbara, a great university in many respects, Nobel Prize winning university, one of 10 University of California campuses. And uh, I decided to find out just what the linkage was between this university and the war industry, thinking that there probably was one. And sure enough, so I submitted a Public Records Act request, and I would urge anyone who's interested in what's going on at their local university to do the same. You know, and I asked for uh, the military research contracts from 2016 to the present, all contracts that had been signed either with the Department of Defense or with uh, the biggest military contractors, the big five, basically. And I, I kept getting, we'll get back to you, we'll get back to you. And finally, they wrote and said, look, there are almost 400, there are 398 contracts. It's going to be very difficult for us to go through all of these to see the non-disclosure agreements. We have to redact some of them. And, uh, and so what is that exactly is your priority? And I said, well, my priority is, as I stated, da, da, da. Uh, anyway, at that point, I thought, wow, 398, that was a lot more than I had thought. Uh, would have been signed. And then I just did, you know, some research online and was able to see that they had uh, an army sponsored research institute called the Institute for Collaborative Biotechnologies. Uh, synthetic biology is a big meme for the army, for the military, uh, for the future. And so this institute is it includes a broad spectrum of scientists, people in the social sciences, as well as the hard sciences, uh, who are researching things like this, you know, how to, how to create super soldiers who can survive on fewer calories or with enhanced hearing and vision. Uh, they research how to make radar absorbent missiles so the other, the enemy uh, cannot see them approaching. Uh, they have Robotic, they're working on robotic soldiers. AI is huge over there. And it's not just this one institute. They also have a, a contract with the Department of Defense, uh, an institute called DARPA. And that is very focused on uh, AI and having weapons that are used without any human involvement, which is quite controversial at the United Nations. Uh, they also have contracts for Biomade with Biomade and other uh, area of the Department of Defense that is researching how to create pop-up bases out of sand um, so we don't have to have these hard, the hard infrastructure for a base. But it's all in preparation for future wars, and they're very clear about that. And not only do they have these uh, relationships with the Department of Defense, but they're very brazen about their work for in service of Northrop Grumman, who we know is uh, has the sole source contract for 600 new ICBMs, although I haven't been able to find a connection with the university on that score. Uh, but they are very uh, bold about touting that relationship and also touting their relationship with Raytheon, 
uh, both of which have local offices, as, well, as does Lockheed Martin in an area not far from Santa Barbara, which they call the Infrared Valley. Uh, and they even have on the website at UCSB, I mean, it says UCSB at the top, University of California, Santa Barbara, and then it says, uh, Raytheon can develop technology here at a fraction of the cost, right? So that that was really uh, just took me off guard that they are so bold and you know, openly recruiting for these military contractors. So I, I thought, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna start a petition. Uh, I want to bring this to the public's attention. Uh, and I don't know, Brian, if you have an opportunity and you can share a screen, uh, just call up a UCSB Code Pink petition. We can take a look at it. Thank you. But uh, so I started circulating the petition. And I did reach out to some of the professors that were listed online as heading up these research projects. I also, sent, uh, and I don't know, Brian, if you have an opportunity and you can share a screen, uh, just call up a UCSB Code Pink petition. We can take a look at it. Thank you. But uh, <laughs> I thought I was hearing a double there. Uh, anyway, that's a, you know what, what the petition looks like. And uh, part of the petition is UCSB, and or, or and part of it, uh, well, actually, there was an article I wrote that af after the petition that has a picture of UCSB, and then underneath it is Yemen, you know, the destruction of Yemen. So it's really juxtaposed. Uh, but uh, so I started circulating this petition. I reached out to the faculty involved. I reached out to the chancellor. It was complete radio silence. Nobody said anything to me. Nobody got back to me. I looked at the finances and, you know, the University of California has a long history of militarism. I mean, uh, they're, they're military gangsters, really. They have at the University of California, Berkeley, at Cal, my alma mater, uh, they used to run exclusively the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory and the Los Alamos Laboratory that produced new nuclear weapons. And now they are run it with the U.S. government, uh, but they still are very, very deeply involved in that. Uh, and so it's not a shock that the University of California is also involved in militarism. It is, it is somewhat surprising, though, because, you know, it's such a beautiful place here and there's a very strong environmental sense. And uh, our local congressperson uh, touts himself as an environmentalist while he openly boasts of getting contracts, military re research contracts for the university. So there's this whole triangulation uh, involved. Uh, after... Uh, I, I got radio silence. I reached out to my local Democratic Socialist of America chapter uh, to endorse the petition. And they did, as did a number of local groups, including one based at the university that's involved in environmental work. Uh, I, since then, have written more about this, more in depth about the relationships and how the university has stonewalled me and re refuses to hand over one of the 398 contracts uh, as soon as I started reaching out to these professors, I didn't hear another word from the uh, can campus council office, which oversees the Public Records Act. But I certainly will continue to try. Uh, short of filing a lawsuit or uh, masses picketing that office, I'm not, I'm not clear on how I will get that information. But as I said, a lot of it is public and online because they don't, are not shy about it. Uh, since I wrote a longer article, that was then picked up by the sociology department, the UCSB Labor Coalition. At the University of California, the graduate students recently succeeded in, in getting their union recognized by the chancellors and by the Board of Regents, which was a huge lift. And so they feel uh, very empowered. Uh, and I, my, the thrust of my article was, why not use that power to say, we, in the future, because perhaps they're under contract now. But in the future, we graduate students are not going to be foot soldiers for the architects of future wars, future weaponry, uh, even you know, a wildcat strike, a work stoppage, any kind of resistance on the part of those involved, which are principally uh, at the College of Engineering and Science. So this article was picked up by the UCSB Labor Coalition, which I think includes about 50 appendages. And a friend of mine who's, who's working with me, who's a graduate student there, shared with me some of the conversation and it went like this. This author is a sexist 
because she's attacking women who are spearheading some of these projects. Uh, and, you know, she's anti-intellectual because she said the, the descriptions of the projects were Im almost impossible for anyone who didn't have a PhD in that niche area of science to follow unless doing some deep research, which I did on the applications of this research. Uh, so basically, you know, it was ad hominem attacks. And uh, finally, one guy said, yeah, but what about this issue of, of us being in service of the Pentagon? I mean, we should have more opportunities. The research uh, budget for the University of California at Santa Barbara of the overall billion dollar budget is about $300 million. It's not clear there's not enough transparency to know how much of that budget, that research budget is allocated to military related work. But I would say it's anywhere from 33 to 100 million dollars, you know, because they have what they call an other category, everything in that other category. So that's the upshot. Uh, what is my message? My message is that this is not just obviously a military industrial complex, this is a military university congressional complex. And in the demand in our petition, the demands were to not renew these contracts for the future and to produce these documents and to stop appealing to our Congress member to uh, obtain more of these military research contracts. Uh, I've also shared that with my congressperson and uh, haven't heard back on that score really. But um, we'll keep on. And meanwhile, our next step is to deliver this petition in person. It's been difficult with COVID and people on and off campus, but deliver this petition in person in early April to a number of offices of administrators involved in uh, obtaining these contracts. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Thanks, Marcy. And I'm going to bring Chris back up on the screen too. But before we take a couple of questions, and I know we're, we're kind of running long. So um, Chris and Marcy, if you if you don't have the time, we could totally understand. But thanks for, for being open to it. Um, I, I just want to make a, one more pitch for the War Industry Resistors Network, which is which is this this group that we have formed. It's relatively new. Um, but if you haven't gotten the chance to yet, I put it in the chat, but check out the new website. Uh, you can find out more information uh, about the network, about, you know, what we're, I just want to make a, one more pitch for the War it Industry is, Resistors Network, the, which, the is, is, which is this, this group that uh, we have formed. From, it's relatively uh, new. Across the country, um, you know, Massachusetts. If you haven't California, gotten the chance to yet, um, I put it in the chat. You're dead. Find uh, a link to check the, out the new uh, website. Uh, first uh, webinar you can find that we did, out more uh, information that Crawford, uh, about, about the network. And Bill about, Hartung, you know, that was an excellent program. program. I just want to make a, uh, one there's more also pitch uh, a way the to war industry yeah, resistors you network. Those sign those up, which is this, you can become part of that we have formed from uh, relatively uh, across the country. Sign up for our If you haven't gotten the chance to yet, conversion to chat. Find uh, a link to the new website. website. Uh, First uh, webinar that we did. That we're not going to be putting a lot of crop uh, work uh, about the uh, network. No hard time. You know, uh, that was an excellent I just want to make a There's also a way to see the war industry resistance, which is absolutely us, which is this part of the species formed from relatively across the country. But those folks shouldn't be kicked out on the street because of that. You know, a lot of those folks have skills, and, you know, we need them to be making green infrastructure. Uh, for the 21st century. There's so many things that we need uh, bright engineers to be doing. Marcy was talking about um, uh, the influence uh, at UC Santa Barbara. We, we saw it here. Uh, we saw it here in, um, uh, sorry, I was double broadcasting there. Thanks for, to, for letting me know. Um, but we saw it here in Massachusetts too, um, at career fairs, uh, at, uh, um, University uh, corporate partnerships. There's an amphitheater at Northeastern University here in Boston named after Raytheon. Um, <laughs> they don't hide it, Marcy. They advertise it. They're proud of it. Um, so it's, it's, it's right there out in the open for us to push back against. There's many ways to resist. Uh, and maybe you have come up with uh, some interesting ones, you know, members of the audience that we need to know about. Uh, and, and the way that you can tell us about that 
uh, is by visiting that website, filling out uh, the form and finding out how you can join the network and make it stronger. Um, we are going to be doing a week of action at the end of April around tax day, uh, actions all across the country, and we'd like representatives in all 50 states. Um, so please join our network and uh, let's, make, let's make a difference because uh, you know together we're going to be a lot stronger than we are uh, as individuals. I think we have time for a couple of questions. Um, so if, if people want to raise their hands, I can bring it up on screen, or you can uh, just uh, put, your, put your question in the chat. Um, okay, uh, Bernard, I see you. I'm going to bring you up on the screen. Uh, yes. Uh, are you familiar with the War Resisters League? Yes, yes. In fact, uh, uh, I'm on their mailing list, so I'm, I'm just assuming you have similar work. That's all. Thank you. Yep. And uh, that's a part of this network is about combining forces, people who are doing similar work. Right. Um, I'll, I'll steal a line from Kathy Kelly out in Chicago. Uh, we don't want to just be, you know, voices in the wilderness. Um, there are so many of us uh, uh, across the country. Um, and, you know, it, it's it helps, uh, it, it helps us too. It helps build enthusiasm and momentum just to know that you're not alone, that there are groups of like-minded people all across the world uh, that, that want peace, that want to push back uh, against the forces uh, that are working uh, uh, towards, towards war and ever raising military budgets. Um, so does anyone else have a question for Marcy or Chris? If not, that's okay. Uh, I know we kind of we kind of ran a bit long. Marcy, do you have uh, a word? I just wanted to I, I wanted to add that uh, one of the tools that we use at Code Pink is a pledge. It's called the STEM pledge. Uh, STEM being, meaning science, technology, engineering, and math. And these programs do start in kindergarten. Uh, that uh, per, the person signing the pledge says they will not go to work for you know a military contractor. So that's uh, something that we're also asking people in college to sign. Wow, that's great to know. And um, including your petition and that pledge, uh, we're gonna send out all the links that we talked about in a follow-up email. Um, so you can take those actions and also spread the word to your network. Um, Paul, I see that you have your hand up. Let me put you on the screen. Yeah, I just wanted to ask uh, Chris, uh, is a, a movement developing among gamers to, to create different types of games that are just as exciting for kids, uh, that actually appeal to kids, that are not you know, moralistic, but really are fun for kids to play? That's a great, great question, Paul. And uh, the, the short answer is yes. The slightly longer answer is that there are amazing games both that are tabletop oriented and tabletop games and role-playing games are seeing a massive resurgence like D&D, Pathfinder and all those. Um, there's a game that I had the pleasure of featuring on the Games for Peace Twitch channel called Solar Punk Futures, which is an amazing game that it really uh, gets creative imagination uh, going for people that are looking to create and develop ideas towards a, a a future that is free of a lot of the existential crises that we face today. I highly recommend that game, Solar Punk Futures, uh, if you're looking for a tabletop game. Uh, but there's games like Echo, which is a game in development by, I'm blanking on the current the university that's developing it, but it's a game similar to Minecraft. Uh, that's a building game uh, that is oriented around finding ecological solutions to an impending disaster. E uh, Echo uses, or Eco uses, um, uh, there's a meteorite about to hit Earth. You you have to develop and create uh, the solutions to avoid it, but it's also to to make sure the meteorite doesn't destroy the Earth. But you also have to do that while taking in the ecological impacts of manifesting industry to implement changes. You have to navigate the society, and this is people that are sitting there playing, much like Minecraft. So you're walking around. Uh, harvesting trees and building buildings and developing technologies and then implementing forms of governance. And that's done with the university. Uh, and that game is really fun. 
Uh, but there are a wide range of games and genres. The the even so in Gamers for Peace and of my personal belief, the games like Call of Duty and the first person shooters and the the those style games aren't the issue. And study after study finds that 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 video game depictions of warfare or militarism or military adjacent things, combat aren't the issue in in the development and implementation of war culture. What the problem is, is how the gaming adjacent spaces, the context that we have around them uh, and the discussions and usage of the military to use them for recruitment and training tools. It's the cultures that develop in those spaces that have um, rhetoric rooted in sexism, uh, patri- like patriotism, racism, it, and get more and more into violent um, rhetoric, like the incel movement and things like that. So like there, a game like Fortnite and Call of Duty isn't the issue. It's the military has been long creating a culture in which it utilizes the gaming space to recruit out of which leaves about 93 when you break down the numbers of how many people uh, actually are eligible and can join the military uh, and do, it actually leaves about 93% of people, of kids that a recruiter touches or talks to or communicates or whatever with are ineligible for military and will never join, right? So that's people that have been primed and groomed to support violence that they are that they are engaging in and desensitized to because of the game, but they then have this backing that creates an issue of oh now this war culture is justified in me because the adults in the room when I'm playing this game have made this violence accessible and okay, and then another adult or a bad faith actor comes in and and preys on that grooming that a recruiter has already predisposed our children to, and takes them further down a road into uh, patriot front extremism, incel extremism, violent backlash against LGBTQ, um, and things like that. So. The games are great. It's it's the culture around the games that we need to take and pay attention to in these platforms. And we have to hold the developers of these platforms accountable for how their platform gets utilized by bad faith actors and the military's participation in that. So, did that answer your question, Paul? It was a slightly yes. long answer, but I wanted to get that oh, yeah, out. Yeah, no, that's, 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 that's great. Uh, it's a complicated thing. One very practical uh, question. If we have a teenager friend and we want to give them a gift, <laughs> how did, can you buy one of these really positive games? Uh, I have, wouldn't even know how to do it. Yeah. Um, um, how, how would you do it and how would you give it to someone? So it depends. There's a couple dependents in there, right? Couple, couple caveats. It depends which game you're trying to get, obviously, or um, or what platform, like system, uh, your child, the child that you're trying to, or the gamer is uh, playing on. So Steam is a pretty universal platform for PC gaming. Um, you can give people games directly through there. You go to Steam. I think it's valve.steve.steam.com. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. And you can go through an entire process, but that actually just gave me an idea to get some uh, a recommendations page up on Gamers for Peace of games that we, as Gamers for Peace, with uh, that have gone through and done this, can start putting out there and saying, "Hey, these are some games uh, I definitely highly recommend." Um, uh, Solar Punk Futures, uh, uh, Space Cats Fight Fascism, uh, Strike. Uh, rise up game changers. A lot of these games are that I'm actually mentioning are rooted in tools for organizing also that give ideas and are used like I, I solar punk futures is probably my favorite activist organizing tool to bring a, pe- a group of people together in a fun way that gets some ideas flowing about what is actually possible to address the situations that we're in right now. Oh, really? Yes, that is it, uh, Stephanie. Uh, we 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 live streamed that with the with the game creators a couple weeks ago, and it was a hit. Um, I will drop. Uh, I will make sure that Brian uh, has a link to our video of the playthrough of that, along with the link to a couple of the games I mentioned um, uh, for anybody to look at when we send this out. Excellent. That's thank you, thank you, Chris Paul. I th- I, I think you actually uh, just 
prompted something new. Maybe there's a, a recommendation page uh, coming soon. Uh, I'm going to go with the final question, John. Uh, I see that you have your hand up. I simply wanted to recommend the possibility of war tax resistance, refusing to pay some amount of war tax, making that a point of conversation with friends, and uh, a, a, a simple act of civil disobedience that a person who cares about these things can uh, make a public statement. Yeah, I think that's a really good recommendation. And right here, I just put it in the chat and I'm gonna be sending it out in a follow-up email, um, ways to join the, the network. There are gonna be all different types of demonstrations happening around tax day, uh, John, between the 17th and the 24th. That's our week of action that the War Industry Resistors Network uh, has committed to all of these groups across the country. Um, more and more, you know, by the day. Uh, our next meeting is going to be March 2nd at 6.30 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, all are welcome. If you uh, fill out that form, uh, we will get in touch with you and let you know what the link is. You know, John, I would encourage you to come to the next meeting. I think that's a great idea, right? I'd, I'd like to hear more about how we can how we can implement that. And that goes for everyone on this call. Um, that's a general meeting of the network. Uh, we're going to be taking these ideas, we're going to be coordinating, um, we're, but most importantly, we're going to be planning to take action. Um, and there's many different ways that you can do that. Uh, we heard about some tonight, um, but we'd love to hear your ideas as well, uh, of people in the audience and people listening on YouTube and Twitter. Um, so I just want to thank Marcy uh, and Chris and David, who had to go and do another program uh, on the Ukraine crisis um, for their wonderful presentations. And, you know, just get involved. That's, that's what I would encourage you to do. Uh, there's a new network and, and we're building it from the ground up and, you know, we need more hands to make it even stronger. So uh, look out for that follow-up email. Uh, it'll include a copy of the recording and I encourage you to just share it with all your friends and family. Um, you know, snowball this, get it, get Fine. in front of more people. Chris, go ahead. Fine. Yeah. Before we go, I wanted to take this one opportunity with everybody in here. If you are, uh, have any, um, hesitancy to having military recruiters doing stuff online. Gamers for Peace does have an ongoing campaign right now that I would be remiss if I didn't use this chance to plug that, uh, campaign real quick. Uh, right now, Gamers for Peace has a campaign directly to Twitch, the platform that I mentioned quite extensively earlier, uh, to allow content creators like ourselves, like Gamers for Peace and anybody else that uses the platform to op be able to opt out of the military showing ads on the our channels. Uh, it is the first step in developing a campaign to make some actual change to impact the military's ability to recruit kids. Uh, I'm gonna drop the link to that in chat. If you could, if anybody that's interested that wants to help out uh, and put an end to uh, military recruitment in gaming spaces. This is the first step, and we I would uh, I would greatly appreciate anybody going there, hitting that, um, and upvoting and commenting on that petition. Uh, really would appreciate it. Love you all. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Chris. I really appreciate that. And as Ken. Uh, from Asheville, North Carolina, and Reject Raytheon down there points out, uh, on March 10th, we're going to do this again, focusing on converting the war economy. Um, so I will also add a link to register for that program on March 10th. Uh, thanks again, Marcy, Chris, and, and David, you. for joining us. Um, and, you know, take action. Peace. Peace, Bernard. That's right. All right. Have a good night, everyone. With you. Thank you, Bernard.